arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa uh, namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Honored one, the enlightened one, fully awakened one, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, they, you know, if you can ever find this, I don't know how you can get it, but there's this little book. You see this little book? I put it here, you see? Okay. And it's called Heart of the Buddha, and it is from a uh, corporate body of the Buddha Educational Foundation in Taipei, Taiwan. Yeah, it's one of those books. You should be able to find it somewhere to get it for free. But this is really a nice little book because it has such great little sayings in it, just tiny little things in it. It's not, you know, it's laid out like this, see, with the symbol for the Buddha and it just has sim simple sayings. But um, I like it because, uh, Simple things, serenity and generosity are qualities of the heart. Insight and collectedness of mind are qualities of the mind. Compassion and wisdom are qualities of the true nature. And these are just tiny things. You take a walk at work, you have this in your pocket. You sit down someplace, if you can go outside and sit. I'm not sure how this all works right now. It has tiny little lessons in it. Like this one has a lesson. Do not become attached to the things that you like too much. Do not cherish aversion to the things you dislike. For sorrow and fear and bondage come, come from one's likes and dislikes. But always be mindful and not the faults of others. So you keep thinking about the kindness. Another one is life is an illusion. This is good. Life is an illusion, a dream, a bubble, a shadow, and nothing is permanent. Nothing is worthy of anger. Nothing is worthy of dispute. Nothing. It's not. Whatever is going on, Never mind, it's going to come and be there, and then it's going to go away. So this is uh, one thing that popped into my mind as I was cleaning up the desk and everything. It's really fun. So today, the first thing I want to do is we are talking about Donna and Sila. In the last lesson we were talking on was about the... Um, the sila in more depths. And we say uh, morality, but if you go find this in Bhikkhu Bodhi's index, I keep telling people it's not there. Precepts is not there, morality is not there. You have to find virtue. And virtue, it's strange they did that, you know, because virtue is not the common word in modern times, it's not the one. But it's, um, that's where it is in the index, in his books. Now, what I'm going to do is read a few things out of the Samyutta Nikaya that had to do with the importance of the sila. And the first place I'm going to go is the Sagata Vaga uh, section of the Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, this is the Devata Samyutta. And this is number 32, and it's on page 106 of Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, Samyutta Nikaya, okay? On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Sawati in Jetis Grove, Anapapandikas Park. And then when the night had advanced, a number of devatas belonging to the Satilupa host who was hosting the monks, and of stunning beauty they came and illuminating the entire of Jetta's Grove, approached the Blessed One. And having approached, they paid homage to the Blessed One and stood to one side. And then one Devata, 
He's standing to one side, recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. Through stinginess and negligence, a gift is not given. One who knows desiring merit should surely give a gift. And then another Devata recited some verses in the presence of the Blessed One. That which the miser fears when he does not give is the very danger that comes to the non-giver. The hunger and thirst that the miser fears afflicts that fool in this world and in the next will follow. Therefore, having removed stinginess, the conqueror of the stain should give a gift, and deeds of merit are the support for living beings. And when they arise in the other world, they shall be. And then another David recited three ver two verses. They do not die among the dead, who, like fellow travelers on the road, provide though they have but little. This is an ancient principle. And some provide from the little they have, and others who are affluent don't like to give. But an offering given from what little one has is worth a thousand times its value. There are stories in many different religions. There's one story I found that um, it, it permeates every religion has the same story. In the Christian version, it's the story in Germany of, uh, or Switzerland, I think it is. There was a story about a church and it was, um, they had a statue of the Virgin Mary that had cried once. And people came there all the time. And they always wanted to see the tears fall from the Virgin Mary's uh, statue. It's full of compassion. You have to understand Mary's the one with full of compassion. And so the people would flock to this church in the wintertime uh, at Christmas because that was the time they could give presents at the feet of uh, Mary and, and of Jesus, you see. And then they would all come and dress as expensively as they could from this place and go there to do this. And in it, after everyone was finished and they had sung most of the hymns in this service, the door creaked open and a tiny boy came in from the snow and he walked down with his hands in his pockets to the front of the church. And he knelt in front of the statue and pulled out of his pocket one coin and put it at the feet of Virgin Mary. And the statue started crying, you see. So that every, every, every tradition, whether it's Jewish or Catholic or Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, have this story and that's the same as this story basically saying that even the tiniest thing one gives, you know, can be the most important gift to a person if they have next to nothing and they give just something. Then when, when Bhante was teaching me about um, all of that, one of the things he said was when he was in Asia, uh, that one of the reasons was not just that he was tall and he was the one that could carry the Buddha on his back when the monks were walking. It wasn't just that. He always gave away uh, some food. Now there is a, there is a dutanga that you can do. The dutangas are the practices the monks can do. There's something like nine or 11 of them. I'm not quite sure how many. And one of those is that when you are living on your alms bowl, you go out for alms. And when you come back to the temple, you give the best that you have in your bowl to each of the monks. So if there's five monks or eight monks or even 10 monks, you give them food from your bowl and then you eat what's left. And if it's a very famous one, because if you can do this every single day for 12 years, you will never, ever be short of food. There will always be enough food in your bowl. 
and it this is this is the lesson where the universe will just make sure that you always have enough food so food and he was saying you have to remember when food is in asia food is the most priceless gift that you can give to someone it isn't to give them money as much as it is to give them a piece of food and the very poor you know the workers that were living in the huts and tents in uh, Amrawati area in Nagpur worked in the fields and everything and you see them I can begin to understand this you know and when I was work living on my bowl in uh, Sri Lanka I told you the story in Horana the first when I was being taught to carry the bowl for alms with a younger nun the woman who came out and where she lived was just so incredibly poor, but she came out to the gate to give something and we stopped and she gave me a potato chip. And you see, what happens is if you don't know the story about giving, then you might cry out like someone did in Chicago. Oh, that was terrible. She should have given you the best food she had in the house. But that wasn't what was going on here, because if you had been there and seen what happened, the way that she put the potato chip in the bowl was very carefully putting it in the bowl. And we said a blessing and she almost had tears in her eyes that she could give something into the bowl. And it meant more than anything in the bowl because of the way she did this, you see? So this whole thing about giving is when you give something, you should know this yourselves. Like he used to say to us, how do you feel when you give a gift? How do you feel in your mind? What happens to your mind when everything leaves and you give something to someone? How do you feel when that happens? This is part of the opening. And so the sila in the beginning, the sila is a preparatory step for the meditation to be able to work in your mind. And the dana, the generosity, is this part that you feel this opening happening in your mind. So everything that is happening in the, 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 uh, the dana uh, sila bhavana part is very important and he's moving he the buddha was moving people to feel this open state and the heart begin to soften just a little bit to get yourself in the right frame of mind yeah so that was what that was and then later when you move to the other three sila samadhi panya we're all familiar with that but for some reason today, we don't hear very much about Dana Sila Bhavana. And the reason we spent time when we wrote this the first time was because Bhante was uh, feeling very badly that that was just disappearing. Because he knew, he knew how that was important. Okay. And you go to another spot in here, this, this whole uh, several section, you go to 154. And, um, let me see if I mark which one, 154, 56. It says here, here, this one is good. They always take delight in food, both the devas and the human beings. And so what sort of spirit could it be that does not take delight in food? When they give out of faith with a heart of confidence, food accrues to the giver himself, both in this world and in the next. Therefore, having removed stinginess, the conqueror of the stain should give a gift and the merits are the support for living beings when they arise in the other world. So this is modern sayings, what you put out, you get back. Whatever 
it is more blessed to give than to receive. There's a Christian version of that. When what goes around comes around. Now, this is also crossing the line into understanding karma, which we'll talk about another time. But, but the going around with the karma is what you put out. That's what comes back to you. And it's a basic rule. And it's nice to be in Asia because a lot of people understand this. And I have uh, the people who are uh, friends of mine, the Sikhs are very active with this, you know, and want to feed the people. And they, the people who work in the temples where they have the large uh, setups for the donating the food, feel wonderful. Everybody feels wonderful when you're making all of this food to give to people to come and eat. They're not preaching to you. They're not saying you have to come to this temple. They're not trying to recruit you. You're feeding them. And then they, they feel good because they're feeding them. And even the men who are in there with these huge, huge pots of food, I was really impressed to look at their faces, are so happy they're there to just give, you see, like that. So this is the reason we say that these parts are, are preparatory. Now, what we're gonna do today is we're going to go to a sutta that I kind of like it. Um, I'm not really sure if I ever heard Bhante teach it, but I pulled it out. And I kind of like this one. This is from the Majima Nikaya. And you go to page 194, 194. And it's called the uh, Chittahila Sutta, the wilderness of the heart. And there's a few uh, words to learn in here and there's a few ideas. And this one has uh, five wildernesses of the heart and five shackles of the heart in the story as you listen and you hear what happens it's very short so i'm going to go through this first and then we'll talk about pieces as we go along a little bit thus have i heard on one occasion the blessed one was living at sawati in jetta's grove anatha pindika's park Venerable sir, will you teach us the Dhamma? And they replied, Venerable sir, the blessed one said this, bhikkhus, that any bhikkhu who has not abandoned the five wildernesses of the heart and not severed the five shackles in the heart should come to growth, increase and fulfillment in the Dhamma and in the discipline. That is impossible. So this is one that's talking about what's impossible and what's possible set up that way. What bhikkhus are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has not abandoned? Here, a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided, and unconfident about the teacher. And thus his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. As his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving, that is the first wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Again, monk, when a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided, and unconfident about the Dhamma, And thus his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. As this man, mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving, 
that is the first, second wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Again, a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided, and unconfident about the Sangha. And thus his mind is not inclined to the ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. And as his mind is not inclined to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving, that is the third wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Again, student, the student who is doubtful, uncertain, undecided, and unconfident about the training. And thus his mind does not want to incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. And as his mind does not incline to the ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving, that is the fourth wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Again, the monk is angry and displeased with his companions in the holy life, resentful and callous towards them, and thus his mind does not incline to the ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. As his mind is not inclined to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving, that is the fifth wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. And these are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has not abandoned. Now, <clears throat> when monks are the five shackles, what are the five shackles in the heart that have, he has not severed? Here, a monk is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst and fever and craving for sensual pleasures. And thus, his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving and his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. And that is the first shackle that is in his heart as he has not severed. Again, the monk is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever, and craving for the body. And as his mind does not incline in that direction. That's the second shackle in the heart that he has not severed. And then a bhikkhu is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, and craving for form. And as his mind does not incline to ardor, that becomes the third shackle in the heart that he has not severed. And then a monk who eats as much as he likes until his belly is full and indulges in the pleasures of sleeping, lolling, and drowsing. As his mind does not incline to the ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving, and that becomes the fifth, fourth, I'm sorry, fourth shackle in the heart that he has not severed. And again, a monk lives the holy life aspiring to some order of gods. Thus, by this virtue and observation, observance or asceticism or holy life, by this ritual, I shall become a great god and be some lesser God, or thus his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. As his mind does not incline to the ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving, this becomes a fifth shackle that is in his heart as he has severed, that he has severed. And these are the five shackles in the heart that he has severed. 
and monks that any monk who has not abandoned these five wildernesses in the heart and severed these five shackles in the heart in the heart they should come to growth increase and fulfillment in the dhamma and the discipline this is impossible and monks that any monk who has abandoned the five wildernesses in the heart and severed, severed the five shackles in the heart should come to growth, increase, and fulfillment in this Dhamma and discipline. This is possible. Let's back up for just a minute, make sure everybody has all these words. So I can't see all of you. I'm not sure if you're confused with any of the words. So I'm going to just fill you in a little bit. To sever means to cut cut off and to strive striving right striving is the same thing as right effort so this is your practice this is twim basically twim is right effort right striving ardor means sincere and pure love devotion means every day you're doing it every day all the time your practice. You're keeping it in the surface of your mind. Uppermost. Perseverance. Don't give up. That's all of us with COVID virus. Don't give up. Okay. Striving. The four steps uh, are the in striving or in effort in the Buddhist teaching are to recognize when there's an unwholesome mind state starting to happen in your mind. To recognize the arising of it, the second step is to release it and to relax your head. Take, let, letting the rest of the tension fall out of your head so that you're not uptight about what happened just then. Third step is to bring up a wholesome mind state instead of the unwholesome that you released and to continue with the wholesome mind state and have more states like that that are wholesome in the future and the fourth step is uh, to continue to grow more of these this is in the text and to grow more of these so when we look at twim this is where Twim is basically nothing more than filling uh, very clearly, the clear understanding, the four steps of right striving or right effort. See, there's really nothing new about Twim. This is what we say, Bhante says sometimes, and we, some people want us to say, oh, Bhante invented this and everything. Well, Bhante put this together so that people would have six tiny steps so that they could complete the four steps. You understand? So if I was to show you this like uh, in, a, in a diagram, let me go over here for just a minute. Can I go over to the screen and pull this up? Hmm, I can't get it there. Whoops, there we go. All right, and if I'm showing you this on the screen, I would just be showing you like this way Here's right effort. And you have one, two, three, four steps. This is all this says, right? First one is to recognize the unwholesome. Whoops. <laughs> well, it means unwholesome state. And the second one is to release your attention off, release, release attention off the unwholesome. That's the second one. Now I draw a line here for a minute because I want to make sure you all understand this. And what we say on this step, the next one is uh, to bring, bring up a wholesome. I'm going to do the other one, bring up a wholesome. And the fourth one is keep the wholesome going. Keep wholesome states going. 
Now, we have to draw a line here. Whoops, wait a minute. Okay. Oops. Okay. 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 Whoops. <laughs> I want to draw a line here. Okay, now I'm going to go back here and go over here and I'm going to take this one. Now, this is right effort over here. This is right effort in the text. And this is TWIM. Let's look at what TWIM actually is. As some people object to TWIM. All TWIM means is tranquil, wisdom, insight, meditation. And what it's talking about is the instructions in several suttas that were left indicate to us, indicated when we were searching for things, that serenity and insight, that's your samatha and vipassana, should be yoked together in order to be able to reach cessation and then experience nibbana. So if that's true, that means there was like, uh, like there was a, I'm going to put you guys down here for a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, that means there was a wagon that was being pulled by two bulls like this, and the bulls were yoked together. And that's how come they could pull the, 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 the wagon, this is the wagon, we can say that's us, pull us through a gate, like this is a gate here. And you have to go through that gate in order to experience cessation and then fall when you come out of cessation, you experience Nibbana. But what we see in modern times, and we don't know when it started, but what we see happening is there are two schools now. One is the Vipassana, the other one is Samatha. And the people in Samatha think they're right, and the people in Vipassana think they're right. And this is just human beings, okay? Okay, um, but what's happening is the the um, serenity practice originally was for the purpose of calming the person down and the vipassana was the purpose was the insight happening but in the texts when we go back to the early texts we find out this these two bulls that are here these two bulls they are not on top of each other like i'm not saying there's two of them like this and they're on top of each other trying to pull a wagon I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're beside each other, just like two horses would pull a wagon or two bulls would pull a wagon yoked together. And we see this all over India. And that's how come the wagon goes well. And if they're not balanced together, pulling together, and one is very strong or the other one is not there or is absent, either way, if there's so much samatha, then, well, it doesn't work. And if there's so much vipassana, apparently it doesn't work either. And so somehow in history, and we have to give Buddhism a break, 2,600 years of history, definitely it's hard to believe that the, they kept the recipe the same. And this is basically what happens in anything that exists. But look at what's happening here. With TWIM, we have six steps. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So in TWIM, we have where we recognize the same way. We recognize the unwholesome. So this one is directly hooked to this one. Then the second one, we have release your attention off of whatever popped up in your mind to pull you away from your practice of meditation. You release your attention off of that, and uh, that one is what would hook on to number two, release it. And then the relaxed step, the relaxed step, we so should have been down lower, but the relaxed step is when you um, relax and smile, you relax your head and you smile. This is very important because the smile 
where you smile right here in the smile is attached to the brain and if this is the brain okay and this is the head these two sections of the brain they need to separate they need to separate like this right here and when they separate that's what allows the pineal gland to work in the mind in the brain and when what does it do it has the uh, endorphins and releases the endorphins and it helps you to experience the uplifted joy, the uplifting lightness in the body and lightness in the mind. So what we're pointing out is that if you smile, these two pieces are, are doing this to the brain when you smile. And it's not a big smile. And you don't have to feel like smiling. This is important to understand. This is not about you coming to me and saying, but I don't feel like smiling because I will give you Bonte's answer and I will say to you, I don't care. <laughs> and just keep smiling, you know, because when you keep smiling, you get this openness in your mind, your brain is not tight. And when your brain is relaxed and open, then you can experience the insights will come more easily. The same ones you're trying to get in, in other ways, if you were trying in other ways. So this relax the head and then smile is a kind of retraining the brain. So this is attached to number three. And then you this smile as you return, return to your object of meditation and repeat this practice and returning and keeping it going is this one or is these two here now if we look at this we should look at this very carefully right effort and the the tranquil wisdom and sight meditation uh, for the simple reason this is supposed to go in a very easy flow recognize release relax smile come back and repeat you only have to repeat when something is trying to pull you away. You don't try to stop your brain from thinking. There is nothing in the, in the suttas anywhere in any of the texts that tells you you're supposed to try to stop your brain from operating. So this is what I wanted to show you. And um, this is just the practice itself. And so we're going to turn this off again. I can't remember how you do that. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so go back. Okay, well, turn this one off. I always have trouble doing this. So sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Okay. So those four steps, it's really important to be able to do that. And the two things that are happening is purification of the mind, of the brain, purification of the brain and retraining of the brain. These are two, two things that are happening. The purification is when you're letting go of the unwholesome state, you're recognizing it and releasing attention off of it. And the retraining is you're retraining your brain to let go of it, relax, smile, and come back. That's the retraining part. Normally what people are doing is they would have a tendency to get curious about what came up, and want to go find out what that is. And uh, we, you know, when they told me uh, originally, some people told me, you know, they say, just note it. But picture this a minute, especially when I went to uh, where the big, the big places where Goenka has the big place with thousands of people are there, you know, sitting there. And you suppose you have a teacher with a microphone who says to you, to 5,000 people, I want you to note it. Now, there's 5,000 brains sitting in front of you. I want you to think about this. Any teacher who's teaching 5,000 brains, when you say something to 5,000 people, do you honestly believe everybody is going to interpret what you said the same way? That's impossible. 
absolutely impossible. And this is one of the um, difficult things for being a guide for all of this because we try very hard to just talk openly about this and try to explain something. But when I look at you, I don't know, do I? I don't know what you're hearing, how you're interpreting it. Very tricky, very tricky. And what was, um, you should see me try to pull my hair out. It's very interesting, pulling my hair out, trying to figure out a way where I can communicate better when I know that communication is me deciding what I want to say. And then I put it together in my head and I say it to one of you. And I have to watch you and see what you hear me say. And then I have to hope that you know what I meant. And, I, I, and then they, they take you away and they put us here. <laughs> and some of you I see, but some of you are on your phones. I can't see you, you know? <laughs> and that's, that's difficult, it's not fair, but we still try the best we can to communicate with you to help you understand how this works. So twin is not changing anything. It's just being very, uh, being very pointed about what exactly has to happen when you let go and or completely let go. So just letting something go is not enough. You have to relax afterwards. And I, people ask me, well, what is this relaxed step? They'll make, a, make it sound like it's a, a part of the instructions for flying a spaceship it's very difficult you know and i'll say to them i'll say okay get yourself in the kitchen and sit in a chair and then have somebody toss a potato or an orange or something to you or an apple and you're sitting there now you're sitting very calm now in your sitting position and when you throw that ball to me i'm going to reach out and catch the ball I'm gonna, my, my zero level tension sort of position is sitting here with my hands in my lap, right? But I'm gonna reach out and catch the ball. When I catch the ball, how do I release? I release it and it falls to the floor. That's the release step. There's nothing to this, it's just release. But the reason you have to do that relaxed step afterwards is because look at where my arm is. My, my zero tension position was with my hand in my lap. Once again, you threw the ball to me and I caught the ball. And when I released it, that was the release. But my arm is still out here. And so I have to relax and then smile as I come back. And when I'm smiling, what am I doing? I'm laughing at myself because I got caught again by a hindrance that pulled me away i let it do that now remember last time i think we talked about this i'll do it again because it's always interesting when the hindrance comes up okay let's do this one on here let's see if i can do this one on here we could get another clean sheet oh, oops it's still there i don't know how that works but we're just going to go like this i remember how to do that okay <laughs> Um, that was the two, two places, the four steps of right effort and the six steps of, of TWIM. Okay, now what I'm going to show you is you're sitting here, just pretend that you're meditating and you're sitting in a chair here and you're sending loving kindness to your spiritual friend out here in the universe. That's where you're sending it to them. They're in your mind and you're sending them loving kindness. And while you're sitting here, all of a sudden, um, this is the one you wanna know, this is the brain and all thoughts are firing off the brain while you're sitting. So these are all the thoughts that your brain is firing, but you're not paying attention to them. But then, a funny looking one happens like this and you all of a sudden move your attention from here. You move the attention away. You do. This does not attack you. The hindrance does not attack you. 
actually your mindfulness slips a little bit and your interest slips away from your friend. Mm -hmm. And your curiosity comes up a little bit because you're a human being. And as the curiosity, curiosity gets stronger, you want to know what this is. And you start, you're the one that moved away. It didn't really pull you away. So when you're first starting, the easiest way to teach you, we found out, was not to explain what I just explained to you, <laughs> okay? The easiest way for me to explain it to you is to say, do you feel like you are being pulled away? Because that's the feeling. It's the motion of the movement of mind's attention from where you're sitting here and your attention starts to move over to that to find out what it is. Now, when you have those 5,000 people and the, and the teacher said, note it, what happened in, that, in the tradition basically was I can interview uh, maybe 20 or 20 people and a large portion, of, they're gonna tell me different things that noting something, noting, by the way, noting, uh, no, let's see, noting is actually a byproduct of notice. Yeah, these two words. Noting something is just to notice it. You know, like you notice when you go outside, the sky is clear, or you notice that there's a monkey in the tree, <laughs> but you don't get involved with the monkey, but you notice it's there. That's all it was. But now when I ask people all these years later of this noting, this noting piece, I can hear people say, well, I need to know what it is. And another person will say to me, I need to know what this, uh, what, oops, wait a minute, uh, what is this right here? And then I move over there and I sit with it and I say, who are you? And where did you come from? And when were you in my life before? And why are, why are you here? I, I get all involved with it and I want to know more about it especially if it was something that happened yesterday and somebody made you mad and all of a sudden you go over there and start thinking about it. Yeah. Or it could have been something from the future and you're worried about it continually and you move over and you stop practicing. So people will say to me, what's the big deal about time when you're practicing? Why is it so important? Well, what is it that's going on here is when we're explaining mindfulness to you, it's an observation skill. It's not about paying attention to something very hard. It's an observation skill, a witnessing skill, a watcher skill. We're trying to show you that the Buddha wanted you to become like a cat sitting on a high piece of furniture, just watching the room. And if you ever watch a cat do that, the cat does not move. It doesn't move at all. It just watches very carefully. And to witness something is not to take it personally. You don't take it personally at all, which is an extension of what we're showing you with Atta and the Buddha's teaching this through and through all of the all of the lessons atta and anatta atta, that the atta we would say is self and no self but let's go one step deeper in defining this if this is the idea of a self let's ask a question what is the consequence of believing that everything I see or hear or smell or taste or touch is part of me? I'm taking everything personally in my life and I'm getting almost moving in a direction. This is the consequence. And the Buddha was more interested in the actual consequence of this than he was in just the word self. That's what we lose if we don't go a little bit deeper. Now, anatta is no self. So what would be the consequence of 
having the idea of no self, well, I wouldn't take things personally. And it moves me in the selfless direction, selflessness instead of selfishness. So that's why we're trying to show you by using uh, that. And this is not new either, okay? Because we have many suttas that talk about the lesson of atta and anatta, personality and non-personality, or identity and non-identity. And when we talk about that in relationship to selfish or selfless, that gets interesting, doesn't it? So these are the questions. And the bun says, someone said, why are you asking so many questions? <laughs> because in the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, you can write this down. In Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta is a lesson. It's in 135, okay? And when we look in that lesson, what we're finding is we better be asking questions. Because <laughs> if we don't ask questions in the next life, we're going to have trouble. Listen to this. Okay, it says, hmm. if the student or the man or the woman do not visit the recluse or the Brahmin and ask, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blamable, blameless? What should be cultivated? What should not be cultivated? You hear all these questions. You see? What kind of action will lead to my harm and suffering for a long time? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of performing and undertaking such action as all these questions, he will uh, reappear in a happy place, a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to a human state, wherever he's reborn, he will be highborn. He will be smart. This is what the Buddha is telling you. It's in section 16 and 17 of Sutta number 135. He talks about this lesson and everybody should remember. So asking questions, basically what happens to that person who doesn't ask the questions, it will lead them. It will, um, he instead, he, when he comes back in the human state, wherever he is reborn, he will be stupid. So one goes to stupidity and one goes to wisdom. I mean, the Buddha was really, he was really cut and dry about this. He told us everything he figured out. Somebody who teaches a class, uh, you know, of the same subject, I'm gonna take these out of here now because I don't know if I'll use it again or not. But somebody who takes a class and starts teaching it, like math or science, I mean, English, prose, poetry, anything, you know? And they keep teaching it for 45 years. Can you imagine what it would be like to go to a history class? Somebody had been teaching history for 45 years. <laughs> imagine how organized and how refined it would be. And if he loved the subject, how much you would find out from him in every detail of everything that you learned. This is what you're looking at with the Buddha. This is what you're, what you're looking at. And that's exciting because he gave us the answers for so many things. And we, we don't go and, and talk about it very much, but that's what I want to do. I want to share that with you. So uh, the... Next one was the four, okay, the four steps. And then shackle, a shackle was a prison irons. And shackles mean they put the, the irons on your feet and on your hand. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, uh, I, I noticed one thing, like uh, when I was uh, really, I, when I was not paying attention to a distraction, uh, automatically the relax is happening. And when okay, I, how long how long have you been practicing TWIM? Uh, I had done uh, online course 
Mm-hmm. Now, like last week, I finished it. Um, it's, it's the relax is ha- automatically happening, and if I do, uh, if I release some tension in my head, uh, it's like much, much clearer. So it, that's are, right, yeah. right. You're exactly right. And in the daytime, asked you uh, how long have you been practicing twim that this would happen. I calculate it. the person comes and if they if they follow the instructions closely and they're doing the relax the release and relax steps that within about maybe a weeks to a month they might come to me because this happened to me with several students of coming to me all of a sudden saying, hey, what's going on? <laughs> They're saying, what are you talking about? Well, this happened and all of a sudden, normally I would get very mad, he said, you know, one student. But now all of a sudden, automatically, my mind is going, yeah, let go, relax, smile, come back. And I'm smiling at myself, but I didn't even ask it to do that. And I'm thinking loving kindness toward this person and compassion instead of uh, instead of sending bad vibe vibrations to the person you see and he didn't expect it it was another case in Florida where this happened to someone in about five weeks and um, so this happens so all this is happening I'll tell you too you remember I told you that people ask sometimes why in the 37 requisites of enlightenment Uh, you have faculties and you have powers. Remember me telling you that? And what did I say about the faculties and the powers? Faith, energy, mindfulness, the concentration, productive concentration, and wisdom. What did I tell you about that? I said, what makes it a faculty and what makes it a power? Is faculties, you have to pay attention to them, pieces, make sure they're happening or check after you sit in meditation, did it happen the right way? But powers is they click and now the mind has adopted them and it's going to do the balancing. You're not concerned with them anymore. And then all of a sudden they're working inside automatically. And this is the same thing that's happening um, when you go out in life and the thing that we love about the twim, we love it so much, is because it is transferable to anybody, anywhere. You can teach someone, uh, nothing to do with religion, nothing. It's humanistic tr- training of how the human body and mind operate. So you can share this teaching with anybody and don't be saying Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. <laughs> and it's human being how the human mind and heart and the body mind connection is operating this is what is so exciting see so you can teach this to a truck driver a taxi driver and uh share it with somebody who's really upset because something happened and you're helping them happens it can be shared with them and much of this teaching when we look at it was this for some specific group of people or or was it humanistic? And it is humanistic. That's the thing about it. He um, looked out. Yeah, exactly. So I'm very, very proud of you. That's very nice. Very good. And this will happen to anybody who keeps using it, keep trying to use it in life. So, yeah. Uh, Do the, you have experience? The, the good part I learned with six hours is when the distraction comes, I should not pay attention to it. Right. And like the more I keep my attention towards the distraction, the more feeding I am doing, the more suffering I am causing to myself. So I should not give that attention to distraction. So that is the so you're seeing it clearly. That is a great. And that's learning. exactly how it works. And so you're offering the cure. And the, what you're doing is you have successfully trained your mind to change the habit of reacting to doing the six R's and you feel better and you feel better. So you almost feel like laughing when you see how this, how well this really works. I mean, it is really something, you know, um, it's, it's special. 
So when we look in here, we're seeing in this sutta, when we go back to it, how they use these words. And they're saying, basically, this is the wilderness. And I think you understood that very well. So the doubt and uncertainty and indecision and a lack of confidence is you're questioning constantly, are these instructions, are they working or are they not really going to work? So remember also, I told you one second to you uh, about this is the how does the brain search in the cognitive psychology research. They find out that the person can change the habitual reaction they have to something to something different. How do they do it? How are they successful? They're successful by doing it the same way again and again to the brain. brain can change with a new habit. And the neural pathway in the brain that was strong for somebody, say, uh, with anger problem, and you're trying to use this for anger management, when you each time let go and relax and smile and come back and laugh at yourself, you should still pat yourself on the back because you caught the feeling of the rising anger. I know that we say this is just happening like that, but we know from the dependent origination that's not how it's happening. We all think that the movie that we watch in the movie theater is happening just, but it's not. It has thousands of individual frames in the movie and then life is moving and the movie is what you see, but the pieces, they edit them in and take them out in the editing room. So when you actually see a movie in the movie theater, there's probably three and a half to four hours of film that was made to produce that movie. And then the editors take the film and they pull out what is no good and piece it together and try to win an Academy Award <laughs> and make a really good movie. That's how all of that works. Well, your life is like a movie and it's called My Life. That's the name of your movie, <laughs> My Life. And you have frames, but if you don't know you have frames, if you don't, you're unaware of them, you can't use the technique of changing your habits to something else. But once you see how everything is working, that's why uh, we have the uh, one attainment that is talked about in the text right in the middle of your development is knowledge and vision of how things actually work. Yata, Bhutana, Nandasana. And that one means I, I see it and I know it by seeing how the steps are operating. So this is like anger, you know, I say something to you and you hear the anger with your ear, the sound hits the ear. Your consciousness comes into this and the meeting of the three pieces make ear contact. And with ear contact as condition, a feeling arises and it's painful feeling. And with the painful feeling as condition, craving then happens. I don't like this. That's the first piece. I don't like it. And it's the first real tightening. You feel a little bit of tightening and a painful feeling. But the moment I jumps into this whole game, things get tight. I don't like this. And then with craving as condition, then clinging arises, upadana. So here was the tanha, now the upadana. When the upadana arises, it moves much faster because it's like the story that runs through your mind of why I don't like it. And that can be because it's like something in the past or it can be something you imagine is going to happen next or whatever it is, you feed it. Ideas, concepts, stories about why you don't like it. 
with upadana as condition, bhava arises. Bhava, what we do with bhava, to make it practical so that you can use it in this situation, uh, is we say that the bhava is like a library in your head. Everybody has a different bhava, bhava library. It's your library of reactions, of what you have always done. When this happens, I always do this in return, you see? And so therefore, what happens very fast in anger is the painful feeling, I don't like it, I don't like it because, and I'm gonna pull this out because in my library it says when something like that happens, I always do this. So then the birth of reaction happens. And when the birth of reaction happens, bang, the person yelled at you, you yell back at the person. The person hits you, you want to hit them back. You see, that's what's happening. So how, how does the person know? It's interesting because you have to say, well, what good is that? Well, what's good with it is that once you understand the pieces of how this works, if you go a little further by continuing to practice and practice letting go, you'll let go just before you burst out. You'll let go during when you're grabbing the Bawa library reaction, you see? And you, and you know, it's irritating to figure out that I have a library in my head and when something happens this way, I'm always gonna go like that. And you think, you mean my life is that narrow? that I'm going to do this every time something's like that, I'm gonna do that. Wait a second, I'm not gonna do that anymore. So I'm gonna close the door on my library. Oh boy, now when something happens, when you yell at me, um, I still can get stirred up because I won't like it and I won't like it because blah, blah, blah in my head. But now I have to stop and think maybe if I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do next. But then go back one more. What if I see the clinging was real? Like when you say something to me, you yell something, I feel the painful feeling. Where do you feel feeling first? Where do you guys think that you feel feeling first? You feel it in your heart and you feel it's in your head, but you feel it really. A lot of people identify the heart feels it very quickly. What if you came home and you did very well at school and you had a um, trophy and you came in to say, gee, look at what I got. I, I won this. Look at this. I won this. And nobody says a word. And you really wanted them to say, I'm really proud of you. But they didn't say a word. They were busy. Yeah, that's nice. And they walk away. You would feel it. You would feel it. You see? So I think it's a it's a viable thing to say that when we feel a painful feeling, even if we're hearing it, smelling it, tasting it, seeing anything, that it doesn't have to be touch. We feel it in our, in our heart. But now you're not gonna use your library and you're not going to cling. You say, wait a minute, I don't wanna to listen to myself rattle through all the stories about why I don't like what I just heard. I'm not gonna do that anymore. Oh, now you decided not to hit the person back. You decided not to follow the advice of the library and you decided not to get involved with the story about why you don't like it. Now, the next one is tough. The next one, the truth of craving, tanha, is we can't get totally free of it until we're an arahat with fruition. So that's kind of bad news. <laughs> but you can't, let's keep trying, okay? But the point is, they're the only ones that are really completely free of craving. But there's nothing that says you can't go as far as sotapanna, sakadagami, and anagami. And the further you go in the direction of those three attainment levels, even if we haven't seen people able to go into the arahat level, the point is you almost never react anymore. It'd be very rare that you ever react anymore because of the state of equanimity and balance that you have, you see? Now, what happened on this? Um, 
I guess we should go back. Let's go back here a minute. Um, uh, let me see. Bunty Damagavesi, do you have a seven link chart in your computer that you can put up? Yes, I'll do that. One second. Because if we look at the seven links, not all 12, but we look at the seven links that we call our seven link work chart or practice chart, we can see real easily what's happening by watching the chart. That's why that's the one you fold up and you put it in your pocket and when somebody yells at you and you yell back, you go over in a corner afterwards, sit down, pull out your chart and say, what just happened? <laughs> what just happened, you see? And you can see what just happened. You can see it, okay? So if you did fight back to the person who yelled at you, if you did strike back or react, what happens next? At the end of the event, you have the aging of the event is from the beginning of the event to the end of the event, okay? And the end of the event, if you struck the person back or yelled back, you have to go through sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And someone very timidly asked me one day, well, he doesn't tell us what that is. And I said, oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. We go to 141. And it's a wonderful place to go sometime in 141. Because in 141, he's going to tell you what each one of these links actually is. We can do this another day. Let's, let's look at the chart here for now. We'll, we'll do that another time. Okay, here, I'm gonna put you guys down here. Okay. So this is a good one because it shows you the example at the bottom. Yeah, okay. So here at the top, um, you have contact and contact happened when the person yelled at you. And this was ear contact. So you see, you had ear plus sound plus consciousness. Meeting of the three is contact. That's how the contact happens. And then with contact as condition, weight in that feeling arises. This was a painful feeling here, okay? And with that painful feeling, with as condition, craving arises. That was tanha. And the tanha was... It always manifests, it always comes up or arrives. It manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. It's a change of tension in your body and in your mind. Nobody walks around with no tension. If you didn't have tension, you just turn into water and sort of slop down on the ground. <laughs> Cohesion has to hold you together, all that water inside of you. So there is a tension in your body, but you feel a difference in the tension of your body, no matter what uh, level you tension you have when this craving hits. And these are red because that's the red zone. And what is the red zone? It's where we believe everything is personal, very strongly. We believe that everything's personal. So the I like it or I don't like it mind, this is the beginning of the personal opinion that is obvious, okay? And then with craving as condition, clinging occur, arises, and with clinging is the story that runs in your mind about why you like or dislike something. And it's really all of the thoughts, opinions, ideas, concepts, stories, and imagination that pops up about why you don't like what happened. And then what happens next is habitual tendency. This is your Bawa library. The Bawa library is your personal library of habitual reactions that you give birth to during the process of cognition. All of this whole chart all 12 links is human cognition. To cognize means to understand how you experience your life with your body and mind. Now, one thing to notice about the chart that's important is that feeling is not the same as emotions. Emotions, the way you can understand what an emotion is, emotions have names, it's easy. 
anger, sadness, depression, sorrow, all of that. Those are the, the named things are the emotions, okay? They start to really come out. You're creating them in craving, running into clinging, and they go all the way to the end and push to the end. The birth of the reaction is the untrained mind always has the birth of reaction. Once you understand the chart and you start to start letting go, sometimes you have the birth of just actions. That's when you slow down. So remember I showed you how you heal, I just told you. First of all, you don't have the reaction happen. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do that again. Whoops, oh boy, now I'm really in trouble. Whoops, where is it? Oh, I lost it. Help, I lost the chart. <laughs> I love this. It's really funny. Banti Dhamma Gavesi, I lost the chart. <laughs> Can you show me? I don't know where I am. Did I leave? No. Can you see me or not? Yes. You can see me. All right. So when I don't know what happened to the chart. Hmm? Okay. When you have the birth of action, what happens last is the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, according to what happened in the situation. And that's the whole story. Now I don't know how to get back to you guys. Let me see if I can do it. There I see. Oh, I got it. Okay. There. Woo. Okay, I'll figure this out one day. So the aging end and the end of the event is the aging and death of the link. It's meaning the aging of the event, the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief and despair. And then there is the death of that single event. That's what happens. Okay. Now, when you gave me the example of anger or I gave it to you, Okay. Um, down at the bottom is an example of what happens with anger, where someone says something is a painful feeling. I don't like it. The anger arises, the story of why you don't like it, your personal habitual reactions, the birth of the reaction and the result of the reaction. That's how the chart works when you're looking at how the human cognition is working through anything that occurs, whether you like something and want it or you, something happens and you don't want it or anything that occurs in your life and you can put it in the chart and you can work it out from there. Okay, let's go back to the sutta. We have to go back to the sutta now. Whoops, there. Oh, okay, I got rid of it. Jeez, how do I do this? Well, I got one of you. Now I don't know how to get all of you. How do I get all of you back? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I love this thing. Okay, now how do I make the, there, whoops, I don't need that. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I love this, it's really funny. Okay. Um, no, oh, added attraction. Don't need that. Let's see. On, on oh, the full screen. Yeah. But I, have, I gave PC. but I only have one. Oh, I got it there. I, whoops, wait a minute. No. Um, what happened? <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. Now I got it here. Oh, everybody has to clap. Okay, now we're gonna go back. Okay, we'll go back to the um, sutta. And what was happening here was you can see he was getting into a lot of problems if you're getting into, um, you're not inclined to devotion, perseverance and striving, but instead you are doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident. All of these pieces 
are what should be developing slowly in your meditation. So you, you have the uh, become more firm and more confident. And if you remember when we take you through the lesson on MN111, Anupada Sutta, we're showing you what's happening in each of the levels as you pass through them. So that if you make a chart, we actually made a chart for that. Um, which was really hard to put on one page, but we did it, <laughs> you know, and you look for these pieces that come in each one of the levels on the path as you're going down the path. And you realize this is real. He wasn't the only one that could do this. Sariputta was not the only one who did it either. The Buddha advised the monks this was a good way to teach and we think that a lot of them were doing it this way. So now when we come over here, we see that the problem was with the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and the doubt, and the doubt in the teacher, and the doubt about the training. So that was the five pieces that he had problems with. And then when we come over here, we look at the shackles, and this is the first shackle um, in the heart, and then the second one um, was um, not being free from uh, this, the lust and the uh, desire, affection, thirst, and fever. Now, let me just say one thing about this. We have to be very careful in modern times that we think we shouldn't have absolutely any feeling or any smiling or anything. And I thought, I never thought about this. When I was learning it, I was learning it in a pretty balanced way. But when I started to teach, someone came in to an interview and said, I have solved the whole problem. And I said, what have you done? I have made a decision that I will not feel anything anymore. <laughs> And I didn't know whether to laugh or cry uh, because this was a, a gross misunderstanding and adama. That's not what is meant to happen because everything that evolves, I knew even then when I was first starting out with teaching, I knew very clearly from my own experience, everything that occurs and evolves in the training has to arise naturally. You see? So this is not something that you make yourself have equanimity. Uh-uh. Nope, doesn't work. In order for the equanimity to come, you personally have to back away and back away and back away. And the further you back away and watch, the stronger and steadier the equanimity becomes. So this was delusional. And what it was about when I said, what was your occupation to the person? And they said they were a high level physicist and another one that went through the same thing said they were a scientist and another one said engineering and I said, oh, that means that these folks are the ones that are going to move the slowest in progress down the path. And why is that? Because they're achievers, high, high achievers, and they want to make everything happen so they can claim I made this happen. But in the Buddhist uh, meditation, everything is occurring from me leaving the building and watching what is left when I, me, my, and mine are not there and not involved. What is the potential of a brain? So I said to them, you know, that's what you need to change your experiment. I mean, you need to change your examination here. You can still have an examination and still have an investigation and experiment that you're doing. And the experiment that I would suggest when you're a doctor, lawyer, well, a doctor, lawyer, judge, lawyer and judges are kind of difficult, but doctors, lawyers, judges, um, in engineering, physicists, scientists, analytical, um, very high IQ and very uh, much in charge of their whole lives and then they want to do this. I mean, I just read yesterday, this is an example, I just read yesterday what someone sent me in a translation that a person had an experience and my, 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 the way I see that is they probably had the first level experience. That was it. They didn't go any further. 
but but it was their translation and their decision to translate the texts from based on that first thing that happens with this this sort of situation is they want to translate the text to match their experience which is backwards it's backwards okay you're supposed to examine the text to see what actually happen and what the results were and everything and then you're supposed to practice to see if you can match the results in your experience that you have but these folks that i've run into over the years decide to say this is what it is based on their own experience without involving even sometimes the text that's very very sad that's sad because it's spoiling What's the, what's the reality here? Because these texts are solid. These texts are far more solid and secure than people thought they were. And that's what we're finding out. Um, so how do you treat that when you're trying to deal with teaching? I was teaching some teachers that we trained. I was talking to them about it. You have to look really carefully. That's why it's important. What is your name? What is your email address? What is your occupation? And they say, I'm retired. That's not good enough. I need to know what the occupation was. Because if you're in your, your 60s or 70s and you're coming to me to learn this meditation and you say I'm retired, but you don't tell me what you did for 60 or 70 years, I can't get a picture of what you're going to do with the instructions and how you're going to be able to progress. So how can I coach you? I can't. And that's when, when the person has, ends up being there for many, many, many years, but someone else comes and they just simply do the instructions. And then in 10 days, they see this is real. And in a few months, they're way down the path. How's that happen? Because they are simply following the instructions. And what did the Buddha say all about all this? Did he say that's ridiculous? No. <laughs> No, he said what he taught was initially easy to understand for the wise. That's one of the easy to understand, immediately effective, um, inviting deeper inspection, and it would be untouched by time. You take those four pieces and look at very carefully at it. Uh, these, I adopted these, these particular ones a translation from Karuna Dasa's book uh, because he was so accurate in what he did. He's a professor from Hong Kong University and he was very accurately trying to figure out from all his research with people that did this, you know, what did this really mean? The Sandatiko, Akaliko, Epasiko, Opanaiko. What did it mean? What did it mean? What did it mean? So, Next time we meet, we're going to talk a little bit about the word wisdom. We, I was going to do it tonight, but I'm not sure if we'll get to it. And to understand this word is key in order to understand how we can progress or not progress in uh, the Dhamma today. Because once you get this code word, this sorted out, and you start using the word wisdom the proper way and you know what it means and when you see it you say you read the section again knowing what it means everything just opens up like a big flower it just opens up like that so okay we're doing words <laughs> wisdom means basically is pointing in the text. It's pointing to the dependent origination chart every single time. It's pointing to it. There's only a couple places we found in the whole of the Majima Nikaya that it wasn't this way. It was just something else. But 99.9% .9 of the time, um, if you listen to the phrase, and his taints were destroyed by seeing with wisdom. What does it mean? That's what you have to say to yourself. You say, he is wise. What does it mean? So what if I told you 
and his taints were destroyed by him seeing completely how and clearly how everything actually works and is connected together. That's what it means. He sees the complete dependent origination, the cognition line completely, utterly in whatever they were talking about. And at the end of the suttas, a lot of times they'll say, and his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. He saw it completely and understood it completely. And when he sat, he watched it. That's what it means. Really, that's what it means. The another way is to say he is wise. He is someone who can see it. When we take apart uh, the one that is 111, it gets really fun when you start translating this as to, to understand, understanding it according to this theory about this being a code word. And you have to test this for yourself. I'm not telling you to believe me. I'm not. I'm not telling you you have to believe what I'm saying. You know that. I've told you this a number of times. I'm trying to show you how to ask questions and figure it out for yourself. We're only responsible for showing you how to stay on this track as you're going along this track and you're practicing. We're the guides, we point. We're not a guru, we're not a teacher. I don't wanna be. I'm happy if you communicate with me and tell me what's happening in your practice to point out if you try this, you'll get back on track. That's what we do, that's what I've been trained to do. Okay, so in the beginning, there's some criticism about this, the way in, in 111, in the beginning of the sutta, um, that he says, Sariputta has great wisdom. Listen to the wisdom, ready? Great wisdom, wide wisdom, joyous wisdom, quick wisdom, keen wisdom, penetrative wisdom. What does it mean? See, first of all, you got to go to the word wisdom. What are they talking about? What the heck is wisdom? And you go to the dictionary, it just says you're wise about everything. <laughs> okay, listen, my son is a nautical engineer and he has nautical wisdom. He can take a ship and he can take the ship from the East Coast to Europe and not sink, <laughs> you know? And somebody who's a physicist has phys physics wisdom and a doctor has medical wisdom. Now, knowledge is one thing, but wisdom is another. And the Buddha knew this. So the Buddha was teaching you specifically that you have to first learn what he's teaching through knowledge and vision. Why did he do that? Because he was a guide and he set up his whole teaching system to be a guide, not to be a teacher. He set it up to, to show you and teach you how to guide someone to stay on track. All these lessons are up this way, yeah? And so uh, when you say, um, let's do this one, joyous wisdom, okay, great wisdom, he understands all of the dependent origination completely, all of it, very clearly. Why? <laughs> The dependent origination in the wide sense, meaning you can see it all around him, happening in other people, happening in dogs, everything. He can see it operating in anything that's alive. He can see this. And, he's, and then, then he has some um, joyous wisdom. He gets happy when he realizes he can watch dependent origination and understand the whole thing. He's very happy from it. Quick wisdom, when he's practicing, when anything happens, I just gave you an example of how the chart works with anger, right? He can see this very quickly. What does it mean in relationship to letting go, relaxing, smiling, and coming back? It means that he is very quick as he's doing that. That's why he was advancing so much keen wisdom. He can look at the deepest part of the dependent origination. And keen means very sharp. When he sees it, he sees more in it than somebody. Most of us have never heard of it. We never heard about it in school. We didn't know why people got mad or angry or depressed or sad or happy 
or felt low or high. No one told us. One of my biggest arguments about this lesson in dependent origination is why aren't we teaching it to our students in high school? Why do they leave and go to college without an understanding of this, this cognition, human cognition? Because the, the, the uh, psychologists and psychiatrists don't want to talk to you about it. They think you're stupid. They don't think you'll understand it. Well, I'm not a genius, but I can explain this to you. <laughs> you know. And the thing is, you can explain it to the person who works in your house so she doesn't get so upset if she is having troubles or something. Anybody can explain it to anybody. This is not a big secret thing. It never was meant to be a big secret thing. Then you have uh, keen wisdom and then penetrative wisdom. Penetrative wisdom is when he's going down the path and he sees everything in terms of dependent origination as he's going through. So the thing about dependent origination is, and we sort of went off the sutta, but I'll do it this way. The thing about it is if you had a bicycle and you were going for a ride on your bike, and suppose you got a flat tire, but your coach didn't show you how to change the tire. What would you do? You have to get off the bike and sit down and cry about it and feel bad and have sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Everybody else drove off, rode their bikes on the, on, but you're stuck. Now, why are you stuck? You're stuck because you don't know how the bike works, right? And why are you sitting there not doing anything about it? Well, because nobody told you how to change a tire. Well, this is the only thing that's happening emotionally for people is we're not explaining to them how emotions happen, feelings and emotions and reactions. But it, once we tell a person who knows absolutely nothing about Buddhism, but is depressed and ready to leave her family and on medication and her husband and child are ready to leave, they're so depressed with living with her. Once we show that person how she becomes depressed, now this isn't with all depressions, but low level depressions can very often, once I tell you what is actually happening, is it happening to you or how is it working? Then all of a sudden they'll look at me like this, you know, they'll go, you mean that this depression, it's not my fault? It's not me? I don't have to blame myself? And you mean this is how it works in all people? And I say, yeah, everybody. Every human being on the face of the earth. This is how human cognition works. And all you have to do is teach them human cognition. And then they stop and look at this. We just talked about it more than I planned, but it's okay. <laughs> we just talked about it with the chart and showed you how do you let go. First, you don't fight back at the person who yelled at you. Second of all, you realize you were doing it the same way. Every time you heard something like that, you did it the same way. So you let go of that looping, the looping, yeah? They call it looping, where it just goes round and round the same reaction. And then you let go of the clinging because you thought it was silly for you to be able uh, to be stuck like that. You thought it was silly. And so that's why you let go. Are we hooked in or is this not working? What's happening? We had a disconnect. What happened? Everybody's frozen in time. Uh, there is a, can you hear my voice? Uh, everybody is frozen in time. <laughs> um, Nobody I can, oh. can hear your voice. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. I, I don't know what happened. Anyway, the most revealing thing to me in mental health is why isn't anybody telling anybody how they work as a human being? I worked in mental health advocacy for four years in legal advocacy for them to make sure they weren't hurt in the justice system in the United States. But what I saw that was so sad about the system 
was there's so many different ways that the doctors groups and everything handle things um, and so many people get put on medication that's pretty heavy duty medication without any explanation of how this is happening in your body. That's what's strange to me. Whereas if you had a broken leg or a broken arm, we would show you an x-ray. And then after we show you an x-ray, we would explain what has to be done and put you in a cast. And then we would talk to you about the healing, of how it operates in your body and affects your circulation system and anatomically and explain this to you. But when something happens from the neck up, we don't tell you much. Now it's getting better in some places. Some groups are beginning to understand they can explain this, but I don't think anybody should assume that by a person's IQ or by a person's education, they can't understand this because I've experimented enough with taxi drivers and truck drivers and heavy equipment operators and people who have uh, problems. And these are just, uh, blue collar working people who are not sometimes very educated, but they can understand it just fine. And so uh, that's one of my big hopes in life that I'll live to see the day where they actually do tell uh, people how their brains, their minds are working in relationship to everything. I don't know where you guys went, but can you hear me? You can? Yeah? yeah. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, so yes, we can. Yeah. I, I will try to. I will try to. Um, I, I, mean, I don't know what happens if I. No, it's not working. Um, I'm going to keep going with the sutta. I can't tell where any of you are anymore. Okay. So we got to the place where the person abandoned the uh, the person who abandons the five wildernesses of the heart and the five shackles in the heart, that they should come to growth and increase and fulfillment in the Dhamma and discipline. It's possible for them, but if you don't, it becomes impossible. The next part of this is talking about um, what are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has abandoned. The bhikkhu is not doubtful or uncertain and decided or unconfident about the teacher any longer. And so he inclines with more ardor and devotion, perseverance and striving. And as his mind inclines towards the ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving, the first wilderness in the heart has been abandoned by him. And then he does it with the second in the same way where he's uh, doubtful in the confidence and then he does it in the third way and in the fourth way in the fifth way he decides he is not angry he's not displeased and his companions in the holy life or in his group are not he's not resentful with them or callous in any way and thus his mind inclines to ardor and devotion and perseverance and striving and as his mind inclines to ardor devotion, perseverance, and striving. Then this fifth wilderness in the heart has been abandoned in him. And these are the, the five wildernesses in the heart that he has abandoned. Only thing I wanna say about that spot <clears throat> is that when you're in COVID, in lockdown, and you're in your family, if you have a family that's in lockdown, it's a fun thing to take a big glass of water or uh, that's clear, you can see through the glass, and you put it on a table, get two glasses of water and put them on the table. First, you, um, you pour some oil in the top of the glass of water, and you're gonna see the oil float to the top and separate from the water. And what this signifies is that people are not, um, not in, not together in the house. They are not um, treating each other properly or you see this is when they're divided, that's what happens. They divide just like what they think, what they want, what they know in the household, uh, like oil and water. Then you take the second glass and you say, now this is what the Buddha really thinks you should be like when you're living together. 
this is what he thinks. And you take some milk and just pour it, just, just a little bit of milk, pour it into the water and don't touch it, just watch it flow into the water and mix with the water. And this is what the Buddha was talking about. We should get together and we should be blending like milk and water. And if we go to 128, you can look this up to see the description of how the monks were living together. And it says, you are all living in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing with each other, blending like milk and water and viewing each other with kindly eyes. But for them to understand what it means to blend like milk and water, <laughs> you just show them. Show them what it's like. The last part of this sutta is um, <clears throat> what are the five shackles in the heart that ha he has severed? The bhikkhu is free from lust, desire, affection, affection and thirst and fever and craving for sensual pleasures. And thus his mind inclines towards ardor, devotion, perseverance, and striving. Okay? And his mind inclines um, with his, his, he does his striving and his uh, uses the practice of right striving. And remember I told you right striving in the text is precisely right effort, the striving and the, um, now, striving is an interesting word, and, and that's about the end of the sutta, but um, except for some things on the last page. Striving is a funny word because when we use the word striving, I want you to strive to succeed in what you're doing, but I don't want you to get exhausted. I don't see any need for you to get exhausted, and the Buddha counseled against exhaustion, and he counseled us to have a smooth practice by um, following his instructions and we would not have the stress and strain and tension that we would have to struggle through. Um, next time we're gonna be talking, um, uh, next time about bhavana, but we're also gonna be getting into the hindrances and we're gonna be starting to talk about the relationship of the hindrances and what he was saying about the hindrances in relationship to your practice. And what we're going to be showing you, probably most of you have never heard it before. If you haven't heard it from us before and you're here, it's a special thing and you should hear it. Everybody should have an opportunity to hear this because the two sets of words in regards to hindrances coming up in your practice, the first set of words made it sound like it would be World War III. <laughs> and the way it went was, you should try to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, suppress them, subdue them, make them stop. And that's the idea some people have about them. And then it's very unfortunate because they can't make progress and some of them even quit meditation because of it. And yet, in the texts, for instance, the Majjhima and the Kaya, there's only one sutta that even leans in that direction. And we're suspicious that it doesn't belong there because there's no other sutta out of 152 that agree with it. And that's because in the Majjhima and the Kaya and the other texts that we look into, we find out you are supposed to uh, release them, relinquish them, let them go let them be, allow them, and, and just allow them why, you would say to me, why should I do that? Because if you understand a Nietzsche, you would understand that all things that arise will always pass away. And when a hindrance arises, it will pass away. So there is no need to be concerned with it because you're not supposed to stop your brain from producing thoughts. It's supposed to slow down on its own naturally as you advance in the meditation practice, okay? So we'll go into that a little bit next time, I think, okay? And 
in order to free yourself from these these shackles, he freed himself from the monk does not live the holy life aspiring to some order of gods in a way where he says by this virtue or observance or asceticism or a ritual or holy life, I shall become a great person, a lesser God. And then his mind inclines towards ardor and devotion and perseverance and striving because he knows do not live your life to become a God. Do not go after your meditation in this way. Do not go to be superior to others. Do not do this kind of thing. Um, these are the five shackles in the heart which he severed. The end of this says basically the monks, any, that any monk who has abandoned these five wildernesses in the heart and severed the five shackles in the heart, that they should come to growth and increase and fulfillment in this Dhamma and discipline, this is possible. He develops a basis for spiritual power consisting in in development that it consisting in his collectedness of mind that is due to enthusiasm and determined striving or right effort can de determined practice of right effort continually he develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in in the uh in the development of his collectedness of uh, mind a collectedness of mind what i'm saying is productive level of concentration due to energy and he's determined and striving and he develops the basis for a spiritual power consisting in reaching a productive level of concentration due to the purity of his mind and due to his investigation techniques being properly pursued that's how he progresses down the path a monk who thus possesses the 15 factors um, you know, including enthusiasm, is capable of breaking out, capable of enlightenment, capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage. And then it tells a little simile. Suppose there were a hen with eight, 10, or 12 eggs, and when she had covered, incubated them, and nurtured them properly, even though she did not wish Oh, that my chicks might pierce their shells with the points of their claws and beaks and hatch out of safely. Still yet the chicks are capable of piercing their shells with points of their claws and beaks and hatching out safely. So too the monk who thus possesses all these factors, including enthusiasm, is capable of breaking out and capable of enlightenment, capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage. So once again, you know, when chickens are in the eggs, you know, she, the hen incubates them and secures them and keeps them away from the fox and tries to hide the nest and all these things. But the chicks, she might not want them to come out, but they're gonna come out. Just like when you have a baby, it's gonna come out, <laughs> okay? You can't stop it. so. It's going to do this naturally. That's the way you should look at your meditation. It's the way that you should contemplate it, that it is naturally developing. And when um, this sutta was over, that is what the Blessed One said, and the bhikkhus were satisfied and divided in the Blessed One's words. And that was the end of that sutta. So, does anybody have any questions? We can take some questions if you'd like. You know, we have a little bit of time here. If not, I'm going to say prayer. Everybody say prayer now? Yeah? Uh, Reverend, uh, I have a question. Okay, I can't see you, so I'm not sure how to do this to get... Wait a minute, exit. Seek up here. Huh? No, it doesn't like anything that I'm touching. Here we go. Let me try this. I don't know what's wrong. Okay, go ahead. Tell me your question. Uh, yeah, reference. Uh, the the sutta contains the four idipada, the four foundation for spiritual 
power. C could you explain those uh, four foundations? Yeah, okay. The um, four spiritual powers. The four spiritual powers are basically, oops, see right here. The spiritual power consisting in concentration that is due to enthusiasm and determined striving. That's the first one, okay? The second one is the basis of spiritual power consisting in a production level, productive level of concentration due to um, physical and mental energy and determined striving. So it means you keep the determined striving just means you keep practicing the right way over and over and over again. And the, the, the powers themselves are proper enthusiasm. The second one is proper energy. And energy is both mental and physical, okay? And then the, um, the, uh, the, the next one is spiritual power consisting of your productive concentration due to purity of mind. And the reason I was choosing this one also is because your purity of mind is based on your Sheila, that you keep your Sheila and you are keeping your generosity and Sheila operating all the time. That's important to reach the state of purity of mind concerning the four powers, okay? And then determine uh, the, um, the last one is the basis for spiritual power uh, consisting in uh, productive concentration due to your investigation. Now, investigation, what this is talking about is curiosity and persistence. Investigation, you can say, well, I'm going to investigate something, but if you don't keep up your curiosity uh, and your persistence, uh, then you can't get deep enough to see how everything is really working. And this is part of what's going on as you're being trained in TWIM, you're being taught to use a microscope. And this microscope is like an electron microscope. You're taught to see, and you're taught to understand the dependent origination, but you're taught how to watch it also in the, in the sense of all the parts of your practice and all the parts of living life. Okay, is, does that clear that up for you? Uh enthusiasm is it uh, is it the same with uh, chanda that uh, bante mentioned about the the wholesome in uh, wholesome goal like that the intention right enthusiasm all four of these aspects are wholesome wholesome enthusiasm wholesome energy wholesome purity of mind and wholesome uh, investigation pursuit all of them are wholesome okay and yeah it is it, you could say it was chanda yeah you could say it because okay. it's like intention you know if you were to say um let me see with this enthusiasm the enthusiasm is how you go about your practice chanda is like a wholesome intention before you go after your practice so yes it's on the wholesome side definitely on the wholesome side so sometimes chanda is a tricky word and sometimes people say, well, um, I think I've told you this before. Uh, sometimes you'll hear somebody say, well, the solution for suffering is to have no desire at all. Is that right? No. You have to question these things when you hear that. You have to question these things because you want to have a wholesome intention for your family to succeed, your relationships to succeed, your work and school and everything to succeed. And these are wholesome pursuits in living my life. And the other thing I've cautioned you about too is when you do look at these texts, pay attention that how you can apply what might be written originally just to the monks how does it fit for the lay person? And don't take the parts that are not part of the lay person's um, following of the Buddha. You understand, okay? And a good, a good example of this, um, I think one of the best examples I ever saw of it 
was someone who was teaching a Satipatthana class in Florida one time, and there was a newlywed couple there who were going to go to Disneyland for their, um, their honeymoon. And they got involved at the temple in going to a Satipatthana training, and they, they liked it until the teacher got to the cemetery contemplation. And I was outside sweeping <laughs> and they said, they, I, they said, I said to them, what's wrong? Aren't you going to go into the class? And they said, we're thinking about not going. And I said, what happened? And he said, they're going to teach the cemetery contemplation to a group of um, basically lay people. And this is a very unhealthy thing to do if you are just getting married. <laughs> this is a very unhealthy thing to do for the lay person. So it's, it's not wise, let's put it this way. The cemetery contemplation is something for monks to do and the monastics to do structurally. Or if you're completely through with your lay life and you want to pursue the cemetery contemplation in older years, that's your prerogative. But you have to be very careful that it doesn't cause you to have a depression or under, it, you have to have a level of acceptance and equanimity to do this. And to ask people who are not trained to go through, even going through that in depth in a class is a no-no. And the fa fact that the, the monks would allow this to be taught there by a lay person that way, it just surprised me very much. And I thought first, I thought I must be wrong. And then I had some Mahatara monks say, no, you're, you're right. It's not something for the lay person. If, if a person were to have, um, this is like how you fine point this thing. If you, in, in the Satipatthana training, you have the, the parts of the body, head hairs, body hairs, skin, teeth, nails, and the whole 30 some odd pieces of the body. For you to learn to just recite that lightly is fine. For you to learn, uh, if you are a man or a woman and you're over lustful, and you want to stop being over lustful. We can show you how to do a practice that takes about four or five weeks to get through the whole thing that has to do with the body parts. And that's not damaging. Yeah, that's not damaging. That's just toning down your lust. And the, we usually tell the story of, you know, uh, if a guy has a problem with this, he sees a woman and he starts getting really upset. You look at the woman again and see the person wrong side out and they're just there with all the body parts. <laughs> Gee, look at her. She's beautiful. What a nice stomach, nice intestines. Wow. You know, <laughs> this is kind of crazy, but this is, this actually works for people. If I teach a, a person to do this properly and train their mind to fall into that recitation after they've learned all those parts very well, um, they can just re do this in their mind and it tone, tones the person down right away. And um, yeah, it's useful. But the cemetery contemplation is a different deal. And there's no way you're going to have two people go on a honeymoon and have a really nice honeymoon and go home and start a family after they have to go and listen to this and have all the pictures shown with it and everything else. This was not cool. So you see what I mean by separating the material sometimes from what's going on from the monastic point of view and what's going on from the lay point of view, right? Hmm? Okay, yes. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Thank you. You're welcome. No questions? No questions? <laughs> Okay, then let's say our closing prayer, okay? Everybody ready? Yes. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving yes. shed all grief and may and all beings find fine. relief. May all beings share this happiness that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space, space and earth, devas, and others of mighty power, share this merit of our 
ours. May they May long they protect, protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu. sadhu.